Okay, so let's go to Roman numeral three on the covenant provisos of lesson 10. We've talked about the Mosaic covenant. Remember the Abrahamic covenant was when God decided to choose a man and make a brand new ethnic, right? right. And he promised to Abraham a son or a, a lineage of, of Jews. Um, he promised him uh, a piece of land in the very center of the earth from God's point of view. And that was uh, in the Middle East, what we know as today of Israel. And he promised them that that would be his, the Jews' land forever and ever. That that just belonged to them, period. Okay. Then, of course, that group of people ended up becoming slaves, enslaved um, by Pharaoh in Egypt. And God did a miraculous miracle in that he did the great escape, the greatest escape in history. And he delivered the Jews out of Egypt, and he brought them to the foot of the mountain, Mount Sinai, where he married them, and they married him. In other words, the people experienced God liberating them from a very bad king and brought those people through the waters of baptism, through the Red Sea, to the foot of the mountain, and then he legislated them. And he said, now I'm your king. I'm, you're no longer under a bad king. You are now under a good king, and you're married to me. You're my people. And he gave them a covenant, and that's what covenant is. The closest thing we understand covenant today is marriage, a marriage covenant, okay? And it's representative in the man being stronger than the woman. She is weaker, and a man is stronger. And so in a covenant relationship, the stronger party makes all the terms. The weaker party either accepts those terms or gets to reject those terms, right? And so that's what happened at the foot of Mount Sinai. They entered into covenant together, and God gave them um, uh, his covenant of what it was going to be like to be married to him, to be in relationship with God. And so the covenant laid out to Israel is full of sanctions as well as rewards. And basically, it's this simple. God said, if you will live my way by faith, and by obedience to my ways, then I'm going to abundantly be to the superlative amount of any people on earth. I am going to abundantly bless your land that you live in, your the animals that you own, your own bodies, the economy, your strength, militarily, politically, in every way. You will always be the head. You will never be the tail in any such circumstance. If you will just rely on me, no matter what the situation looks like, if you will just rely on me, that's what you're going to see. And you're going to be a demonstration to the world of what it's like to serve the one true God. Because that's why Israel was chosen. They were chosen for service, not for salvation. But salvation had been made available to them. But if you choose to disobey me and not live by faith and rather live in unbelief, then what there's going to be is there are sanctions. And then, to a superlative degree, you're going to experience my curses in your land, in your animals, in your bodies, in your economy, in your strength. I'm going to use plagues that will be brought in. I'm going to allow certain pestilence to touch uh, the land as well as your own bodies. Your economies will come become weak. You will not have strength, even if you're militarily you know, beefed up, which they weren't supposed to be. You're going to experience poor weather patterns rather than normal, right, good weather patterns. Does all of this sound good? Yeah, yeah. yeah, right. We right. talk about today. Oh, yeah. exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I'm going to send earthquakes, and then if you won't listen to all of that, if I can't get your attention by all of that, you will be invaded. And then you will eventually be booted out of your land because even though you own the land, your right to stay in the land is conditional. It's based on faith and obedience. If you don't want to obey me, then you don't get to stay in your land even though you own it. So occupation is conditional. Ownership is unconditional. Do you see the difference? And that's the big difference between the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant. And either way, this is going to be not only an example to the whole world about the one true God, but it's also going to be an example to all of the other nations of the world that this is how I deal with man. Okay? And that's exactly how he has done it. 
Americans are wondering, what is going on with this weather? <laughs> right? And I'm just like, oh, man. <laughs> so, no. And, you know, we, we've got all sorts of invasions happening right now into our country that are upsetting the balance because it's not being done according to the legal way that we've set up. There's all sorts of things, and it's causing all sorts of confusion. And God is dealing with us. He is so consistent. It's just amazing. All right? Well, sure enough, what happened? Long story short, they ended up disobeying and not living by faith. And God strived and strived and strived with Israel. And you know what? They ended up getting booted out of their land is what they ended up. They ended up going into Assyria, first part of them, and then about 100 years later or so, Babylon came. If you, I think, do I have in your notes, um, under Roman number three, letter B, do I have... The um, the biblical um, account, Dread, uh, Deuteronomy 28 listed there. Mm -hmm. yes. I, I, I encourage you to read that. Read Deuteronomy 28 when you have a chance. And you will really see how God says, if you notice all the ifs when you read it. It's just amazing, okay? All right, anyways. So God gave them pretty much that ideal at the foot of uh, Mount Sinai where they married each other. Now, we know that he gave them the law. And when we think of the law, we usually think of the big ten ones, the Ten Commandments, right? There were 603 other laws that were added to it. So really, actually, the law was 613 commandments, but we know what the ten big ones were. Um, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. There shall be no graven images. Do not take the name of the Lord in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and mother so your days may be long. Um, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, no false witness, and no coveting. Those are the ten big ones. Those are the ten commandments, okay? Now, I just want to help you to understand that this really is a perfect set of rules for people to live together in a society. The first four commandments deal with a person's relationship in a vertical direction. The first four deal with your relationship with God. You should have no other gods before me. I'm the only one. No graven images. Don't take my name in vain. And remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Okay? Commandments 5 through 9, the next five commandments, deal with our relationship with other people. So now we're talking horizontal. Right? Think about it. Honor your father and mother. That's horizontal. No murder. No adultery, no stealing, no false witness. That all has to do with how we should deal with others. The last one, however, is a heart issue. No coveting. That deals with your own heart. And that's you and your relationship with yourself. Okay? So here's basically the problem with this law. Even though if everybody were to keep this law perfectly, we would not have any problems in society. Right? But... The law, when forced from the outside, which was written on stone, it was on the outside of people, it will never work. It would be like me telling you right now, whatever you do right now, you are not allowed to imagine what a pink elephant looks like <laughs> and what just happened. Mm -hmm. Every one of, do you see what I mean? Every one of you went there. It's something in human nature because of our sin nature that when we're told not to do something we just absolutely do it that's how messed up we were from the garden of eden okay um so what is the solution to the law then what is there any hope my, my son michael he's my youngest one um <laughs> he always oh my goodness i never had a problem with megan austin or caitlin of wanting to get in the shower and get cleaned up and brush their teeth but michael he was just my boy. He was, you know, they were always all outside playing, and he just got as dirty as everyone. But for some reason, he just resisted a shower and brushing his teeth. Oh, mom, you know that whole thing. It was just, it was just constant raising my. Michael, take a shower. Michael, go brush your teeth. Mike, I was so tired of saying it. I was just like, what? Will this ever change? And all of a sudden, one day, he's like, Mom, I need clean underwear. Like I'm like, what does he care? You know? And he's brushing his teeth. What happened? A girl. A girl. A girl. <laughs> <laughs> a girl. Oh, no. Something.
screen got on the inside of him that his mama couldn't get to. A girl affected him, and now he wanted to take a shower. He wanted clean underwear. He wanted toothpaste. He wanted cologne. He wanted it all. And it's just, it was just like, right? And that's what needed to happen, okay? See, we're when we're under the law of Moses, which is the law that's written on the outside of you, you know what that does? It kills you. See, actually, it did kill. What happened is Moses was told, I want you to come up on the mountain. God said, come on up here because I'm going to give you all of my laws. And that's when God took his finger and he wrote the laws in stone, right? And so all of a sudden, Moses is coming down the mountain with the two stones on, you know, both of the, he's carrying two stones with God's laws written in stone on the outside. And he can't believe what he sees. He looks and he sees all of the Israelites who had just been delivered from a bad king being slaves and they had built a golden calf and they were having a big old party and actually an orgy was taking place as he had come down that mountain. Let's go read about it. Go to Exodus chapter 31. Yeah, what's it ever said? How long Moses was up on that mountain? Because how did they have time to do it? Yeah, it was always, I've always had a bad Yeah, that's it. He's not coming back. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, let's see. I have. Yeah. Let's start in 18. Verse 18 of chapter 31. Okay, and then we're going to go right on into 32. Reading out of the NLT. And this is what um, it said. When the Lord finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant written by the finger of God. When the people saw how long, so it was a long time, Trisha, yes. it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron, that's Moses' brother. He said, come on, and he said, make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow mm -hmm. Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So Aaron said, okay, take the gold rings from your ears of your wives, sons, and daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off all of their gold rings from their ears, and they brought them to Aaron. Remember how God said, strip the land of Egypt when you get out? Remember that? They got all the goods. Aaron took the gold, melted it down, and molded it into the shape of a calf. And when the people saw it, they exclaimed, Oh, Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Can you believe that? And Aaron saw how excited the people were, were, so he built an altar in front of the calf, and then he announced, Tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. And the people got up early the next morning to sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings. And after this, they celebrated with feastings and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. And that's where the orgy came in. The Lord told Moses, Quick! Go down the mountain. Now notice what the Lord says here. Your people, <laughs> whom you brought from the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. How quickly they have turned away from the way I commanded them to live. They have melted down gold and made a calf. And they have bowed down and sacrificed to it. And they are saying, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And then the Lord said, I have seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are. Now leave me alone so my fierce anger can blaze against them and I will destroy them. And then I will make you, Moses, into a great nation. But Moses tried to pacify the Lord his God. He said, oh, Lord, why are you so angry with your own people whom you brought from the land of Egypt with such great power and such a strong hand? Why let the Egyptians say their God rescued them with the evil intention of slaughtering them in the mountains and wiping them from the face of the earth? Turn away from your fierce anger. Change your mind about this terrible disaster that you have threatened against your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You bound yourself with an oath to them, saying, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven, and I will give them all of this land that I have promised to your descendants, and they will possess it forever. So the Lord changed his mind about the terrible disaster he had threatened to bring on his people. Then Moses turned and went down the mountain, and he held in his hands the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant. They were inscribed on both sides, front and back. These tablets were God's work. The words on them were written by God himself. When Joshua heard the boisterous noise of the people shouting below them, he said to Moses, It sounds like war in the camp, but Moses replied, Nope. 
It's a shout of victory, not a wailing of defeat. I hear the sound of a celebration. When they came near the camp, Moses saw the calf and the dancing, and he burned with anger. He threw the stone tablets to the ground, smashing them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf they had made and burned it, then he ground it into powder. He threw it into the water, and he forced the people to drink it. Finally, he turned to Aaron, and he demanded, What did these people do to you to make you bring such terrible sin upon them? Oh, don't be so upset, my lord, Aaron replied. You yourself know how evil these people are. They said to me, Make us gods who will lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So I told them, well, whoever has gold jewelry, take it off. And when they brought it to me, I simply threw it into the fire and <laughs> out popped this cat. <laughs> <laughs> Moses saw that Aaron had let the people get completely out of control, much to the amusement of their enemies. So he stood at the entrance to the camp and he shouted, All of you who are on the Lord's side, come here and join me. And so all the Levites gathered around him. Now that would be the tribe of Levi. Remember how Jacob had 12 sons? One of his sons' name was Levi. And Levi ended up, you know, having a whole tribe, right? Bless you. Moses told him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Now he's talking to the Levites. Each of you, each Levite, take your sword, go back and forth from one end of the camp to the other. Kill everyone, even your brothers, friends, and neighbors. The Levites obeyed Moses' command, and about 3,000 people died that day. And then Moses told the Levites, today you have ordained yourselves for the service of the Lord. You obey him, even though it meant killing your own sons and brothers. Today you have earned a blessing. Isn't that incredible? See, that's how serious God is about sin. That he would call his own people, the Levites, who had separated themselves and said, we're not going to be a part of that. We know that that's against God. And, and, and be willing to strap on their sword and kill men, women, and children that there were their relatives. Because that's how serious God is about sin. And I've got to say, <clears throat> excuse me, this is exactly what America's church has lost. The seriousness of sin. Because why? Because the American church is teaching on the love of God. That God is just a loving, loving God. He just loves, loves, loves. No, God is a God also of hate. Hatred of what? Sin. To what point? That he will kill. Yes. Um, last night you were talking about, um, like you were generalizing things, but you said within it, there's always a remnant. Yes. So this, there was a remnant, there was still a remnant within that group. Right. And so he killed, they killed 3,000. Those 3,000 were the ones that there were a lot more Jews at that point than just 3,000. There's an estimated two and a half million that came out of Egypt is the estimation. Okay. But these 3,000s are the ones that were dancing around the calf and, and doing all that pagan worship stuff, okay? And it was those that were killed. Is it true that, like, um, this is the before Jesus came, so yep. the wages of sin is death, but Jesus came and died for our sins? Mm -hmm. He so. is, which is excellent point, except that I'm going to show you in a minute something about this side of the cross that has this seriousness that we're talking about in it as well, Okay. All right, now, that's what it was like. God put his law in stone, and the law pointed out how sinful we really are, that we really don't want to follow the law. But now, of course, as Logan has just pointed out, we are no longer under the law of Moses. We are now under the law of Christ, right? And Christ was raised and overcame death by the Holy Spirit. So what's the big difference between the law of Moses and the law of Christ? Well, here it is. Let me put it right here. You've got the law of Moses and the law of Christ. The law of Moses brought death and always does. But the law of Christ brings to people life. 
So you can see just by us living on this side of the cross and not the other side of the cross, we're in a much better position, aren't we? Isn't it great? Thank you, Lord, for that. But this law of Christ that we're living under are for those who, that's a conditional statement, right? Are those who do what? Repent of their sins. What's repenting mean? We're going to really get into that in the future. It means turning from your former way of living, not having any part of it anymore. And who believe in Jesus, who are baptized in water and baptized in spirit because you're going to need a power from within to be able to live um, different from your former lifestyle. Okay? And that's the difference. Now, it just so happened that after Jesus completed his work on the cross, he went to the grave, he was raised up by the Holy Spirit, the Christ, or, um, the Holy Spirit raised him to life again, and um, and then, let's see, 50, uh, 40 days later, he was taken up to heaven, right? Ten days after he was taken up to heaven was Pentecost, and that was the inauguration of the church, because that's when the Holy Spirit came down and fell upon the 120 in Acts chapter 2, and they were filled with Holy Spirit, and we call that the day of Pentecost, and as Christians, we go, oh, Pentecost, yeah, the, the, that was, yeah, we get it, that's the day that the church began, or we would also say this, that's the day that man, redeemed man, was given Holy Spirit, that he can now receive Holy Spirit. He can receive a spirit of power, the power of God, the person of God, the third person of the Trinity, to come and live and to give him the power to, to live a holy life, right? But think about this. What did Pentecost actually celebrate for the Jews? It was a holiday that day that the Holy Spirit came down. It wasn't a Christian holiday. That was the beginning. It was a Jewish holiday. And Pentecost was a celebration of Moses coming down the mountain with what? The law. It's 50 days after Passover. It was 50 days after they had come out of Egypt. 50 days later, Moses came down with the law in his hands. And so that's what they were celebrating on Pentecost. That was why Pentecost was celebrated in um, Israel. So they're all celebrating the day that Moses came down the mountain with the law of God. And what happened on that day? 3,000 people were killed that day. But now, right here, after Jesus has just gone back to heaven, and 10 days later, it's now Pentecost, and all of Israel is celebrating the day, Pentecost, that Moses came down the mountain with the law of God, what comes down from heaven? The Holy Spirit comes down from heaven. And it does the exact opposite thing that happened the day that Moses came down the mountain. Go with me to Acts chapter 2, please, in the New Testament. And I'm going to show you the reversal of what happened. So, the Holy Spirit has come down on 120. They're all speaking in different tongues. And a whole bunch of people are hearing this going, what in the world? What's happening? What's going on? I don't get it. What's going on? A couple of people said, they must be drunk. And, and so Peter gets up, and he preaches just this most incredible, incredible sermon. No, these people aren't drunk. This is actually what's happened. And he explains the whole gospel of Jesus Christ, right? And so as soon as he's done preaching, because he's just been anointed by the Holy Spirit to get up and preach, he hadn't prepared for it. It was definitely the Holy Spirit speaking through him. What happens in verse 37? It says that Peter's words pierced their hearts. And they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do then after Peter's preaching? And Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you and to your children and even to the Gentiles, all who have been called by the Lord our God. And then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves 
from this crooked generation or this evil world. And listen to this, verse 31. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about how many? 3,000 wow. in all. Wow. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Many, many years prior, Moses came down from the mountain and ended up 3,000 getting killed. Because that's what the law does. Is it a good law? Is it a right law? Is it a holy law? Yes, it is. But when it's written on the outside of you, the only thing it's going to produce is death. It's just never going to get done. You see that? Yeah. But now, the Lord didn't just send Jesus, his son, to go to the cross so that there is a way for us to deal with our sins. He's now done something even more incredible, well, not more incredible, but equally incredible by also giving us a second gift, you know, giving us um, God the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, which is the power that gives to us what? <laughs> Life. Exactly. And that's the big difference between living before the cross and living after the cross. And you say, yeah, but if we're not under the law of Moses and if we're under the law of Christ, then are we done with the Ten Commandments? Well, the answer to that is yes and no. Jesus came and fulfilled those Ten Commandments perfectly. He was able to do it, so they got accomplished. By whom? By Jesus. Jesus absolutely was able to fulfill every one of those commandments perfect, perfectly. And then go to the cross as a perfect lamb that shed his blood to cover us. But then he went back to heaven so that we would get the Holy Spirit so that now we would have power to what? To be able to keep God's holy, beautiful, wonderful law that he loves. Now here's the thing. Somebody said last week, 613 commandments. Yikes, that's tough. That's really, really, really tough. And it's true, it is. But actually, there was a Jew in Israel who studied Christianity, and he studied his own Torah-based Judaism, and he said, all right, I'm going to try to, for a month, keep the law of Judaism. You know, I'm just going to do my best to keep the law. And he felt like he did pretty well at it. But then he went and he studied what Christianity spells out, and he said, there's no way I could possibly keep the law of Christ. It was impossible for me to do. And you think, well, why is that? Because I thought you lived under, I thought it was easier. Living is easier and harder at the same time. Let me explain. And this is a key. The law of Christ that we live under exceeds, goes beyond the law of righteousness or the law of Moses. The law of Christ is harder, but it's also easier. Let me explain. Jesus came along when he was on earth, and he gave a lot of sermons to people. And in one of his first big sermons, he explained really what the law of Moses was. He interpreted the law correctly for us. And he said, you know that it is written, it says, thou shalt not murder. Right? Has anybody in this room ever committed murder? No. Actually, we have. Every single one of us in this room has committed murder because Jesus said, but here's what the law really means. If you hate your brother, then you have committed murder. That means if you've ever hated someone, even for a second, do you know that um, saying, if looks could kill? Mm -hmm. That comes from the heart. If looks could kill, you would have what? Nope. Murdered them. And we've all done it. We've all been guilty of that. So do you see how it's easier to live under the law of Moses and not take a knife to someone's throat ever in your whole life versus the law of Christ to not ever hate your brother after what he's done to you? Here was another thing that Jesus said in interpreting the law. You've heard it said or it is written, thou shalt not commit adultery. Mm -hmm. Obviously, sex outside of your marriage. Well, in marriage, but you know what I mean, outside of marriage. So, there's a lot of people who've been able to remain married and stay pure in that marriage relationship. Jesus comes along and he goes, well, let me tell you actually what it really means. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, if you've ever looked upon someone with lust in your heart, 
you have committed adultery. Boom, guilty. Do you see that? We're all guilty. Guilty, guilty. He goes on. In other words, the law of Christ exceeds. It goes way beyond. It's what's on the inside. It's like how I was explaining about my boy. I could go ahead and I could make him take a shower, which I did. You have to get in the shower. You have to take a shower. You have to retrieve it. But all of a sudden, when he wanted to, I guarantee you the quality of the shower <laughs> got a lot better and the quality of brushing his teeth and everything else because now he wanted to keep the rules of the household that says you need to shower and you need to brush your teeth. Now he wanted to do it. And that is what the Holy Spirit comes and does for us. We want to keep the law, not according to Moses, but now according to Christ, the desires that are in the, our hearts. And we can only do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is so, that's why it's so important for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And can you imagine there's people in churches out there saying, no, I don't want to hear about baptism and Holy Spirit. I don't want, what do you mean? That's like having a weapon without any ammo, having an AR-15 and having no ammo. What's, how stupid is that? It's where all the power is, is where the Holy Spirit is. See, the Holy Spirit has the ability to come inside and change the desires from the inside. So now you're not going to want to hate your brother. Now you have the ability to actually what? Love your brother. To be able to do things that you never thought. To love an enemy just as Christ loved us. We were his enemies. But do you see, this is a partnership with the Holy Spirit. If you're going to try your hardest Oh, by the way, that Jew, oh, I told you that. He, he's like, there's no way I can live a life of Christianity. It's much harder than the law of Moses. Interesting, because he didn't know about the Holy Spirit. He didn't understand that. You see that? Mm -hmm. If you're going to try to live by the law of Moses, it's a one-way street. It's a one-way street in relationship to God. All it is is you just trying, trying, trying to please God. It's one way. It's one way. But if you will live by the power of the Holy Spirit, now you're on a two-way street, if you will. It's a relationship between you and God. It's a partnership. Jesus was pleased and satisfied him. And so now we have this relationship going back and forth. Now you can come to the Lord and you can say, okay, Lord, this person is driving me nuts. And I'm honest. I want to kill him. I need a work inside me. I don't need you to change. I need the work. I need your feelings about that person. And boy, all of a sudden, things just you see what's available to us as believers? The resources of heaven, Ginger. So um, in Acts 2.38, when it says, then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So now I'm assuming this means prior to Holy Spirit baptism. That is Holy Spirit baptism because they were all just baptized in Holy Spirit okay, so, in that chapter. So for them, it happened all at once. Yeah. Now, well, no, because think about it. They were praying for 10 days waiting on the Holy Spirit baptism, but they, were, they had repented and they believed in Jesus. They were baptized, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm totally jumping ahead because we have water baptism and water and baptism the foundation and stones, spirit which baptism. I'll, I'll get all of that. But so before spirit baptism for people that maybe have repented, maybe they've been water baptized but haven't had spirit baptism, do they still have access to this Holy Spirit? Absolutely. Any okay. believer does. In fact, you can't be an unbeliever and ever receive Holy Spirit. It says that. Only believers can receive Holy Spirit. It's the only uh, people on earth that Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, is available to is believers. Okay? Yes, Julie. I was a believer for 10 years until I got baptized in the Spirit. Yep. So I changed your whole I world. Changed it yeah. Because then I started getting revelation after revelation. Yep. You <clears> started hearing from God. That, I didn't. Mm -hmm. I was just like flat, right. no power, no right. revelation. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's what you were talking about. That's what you felt Sunday when you were talking about James. You know, um, the Holy Spirit is um, a person. And he's spirit. It's hard for us to relate to him because we think about Jesus with a body. And the Holy Spirit doesn't have a body, right? But there's many symbols in the Bible. Water is a symbol. Fire is a symbol. Oil and so forth. But fire, you said I felt like fire in my gut. That's power. Fire is the <coughs> symbol of the Holy Spirit's power. Water is a symbol of the Holy Spirit's purity. And he wants to bring both to our life. He can bring purity 
to us and give us pure desires, but he can also bring power that says, wow. And that's what's been missing in your life. You want Holy Spirit power. That's the only way to live. I'm going to tell you something. Without that, I I wouldn't want Christianity. It would become a bunch of do's and don'ts. Mm -hmm. That's all it would be. I could believe my church never told me about Yeah, no, and that's... And that's what I was talking about last night, just so you understood after last night's teaching why it got that way, right? Yeah, mm -hmm, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Okay, so the Ten Commandments reveal three basic principles. And the three basic principles, it really it makes total sense from God. Respect, responsibility, and retribution. On, on the last page, I believe, no, second to the last page, whatever, of your own. Um, of your lesson, okay? I don't know where it is on your page. Okay, thanks. All right, let's talk about respect. Think about it. If you go through all of those Ten Commandments, it's respect for God, for his name, for his day, for people, for family life, for life itself, for marriage, for people's property, for people's reputation. A loss of respect for God will end up leading to idolatry. A loss of respect for people will lead to immorality, thus injustice. Let me, let me lay out some, uh, I want to lay out a principle for you that's really, really, really important that a lot of people don't understand. And, and I want to talk in terms of our country and politics for a moment. Okay, you've got the two major parties, you've got Republicans, and you've got Democrats. And if you go to a bunch of Republicans and say, um, listen, what is the main problem today in America? They will say America is immoral based on abortion alone because we're killing babies. It's murder. Thou shalt not murder. That is the main problem of America. Well, then you go over to the Democrats and you say to them, well, what do you consider that the main problem is today in the United States of America? And they will say, no, no, the problem is, is injustice. There's social injustices, and that's the worst problem that there could possibly be. I'm here to tell you today that both of those answers are actually wrong because both of those behaviors, immorality and injustice, flow from something else. What do they flow from? Idolatry. Idolatry always leads to immorality of some sort, whether it's injustice or any injustice, which is murder is an injustice, right? Anything. And so the problem in our land is not abortion or social injustices. Those are symptoms of the problem. The problem in our land is idolatry. We have a wrong image of God. We've either discarded God, which that's really basically where we are. We've said, no, thank you, God. We don't want you anymore. But before we said, no, thank you anymore, like 20 years ago, what we had done is we recast an image of who God is. We made a golden calf in our minds about what is God really like. Mm -hmm. And what was the golden calf of? Oh, God yeah. just loves everybody. He just loves. And he doesn't care about sin. He just loves because he sent Jesus. So Jesus takes care of it all so I can call on his name. I got my ticket to heaven, and I can live in sin and do whatever I want. That's idolatry, and that's the number one problem today in America and everywhere else in the world where there's problems. We have a wrong idea of God. We've lost respect. The fear of God is what? The beginning of wisdom, says the Bible. And it begins with a fear of God to say, I want to know who you are, God. I want to know what your character is like. Does he, is he a God of love? Yes. But you know that you've got to read almost to the very end of the Bible before you read that God is love. You know what you read about a lot more before you get to the end of the Bible? That God is a God of hate. Hate of what? Hate of sin to the point where, yes, if you reject his ways, then you know what? You're going to end up being killed. It's the seriousness of God. I've never been taught. This is crazy. This is <laughs> right. Mind blowing. This is yeah, mind blowing. There are two sides to every I've coin, isn't heard. there? Isn't yeah. there two sides to every sense. coin? All we've done is focused on one side of the coin of God's character, and what we have done is we've given a wrong image of God to the world. And the greatest, greatest deception to man, at least in this country, and I'll say to the world is he's been given a wrong image of God. 
And he lives in a fool's paradise now. Yes. I feel like this, what you're talking about is how people just know God is love. God will love me no matter what I do. And they mm -hmm. continue to live in sin. They don't, mm -hmm. they live by the world's rules. That's right. I mean, that's part of the reason why a lot of people don't want anything to do with religion. Because we see these people out there living these fake lives yeah. where they're preaching something, but then they're behind acting the scenes, totally they're doing horrible. That. Right. They've lost their fear of and, God. Right. But it makes a lot of people not want anything to anything do with religion. Because they're like, oh my gosh. It's no difference. Like, There's no yeah. difference. Right. You know, exactly. like, who's better here? No. You're not as, you're not better. And that's why one of the scariest verses for me in the Bible is when uh, Jesus said that people will come before him at, at judgment yeah. and, he, and he will say, depart from me. Mm -hmm. I never knew you. And they will say, wait, but we prayed in your name. We prophesied in your name. We did miracles in your name. We did that. We were busy doing, 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 but they were never known by God. They never took the time to understand his character mm -hmm. and to get in a proper relationship with him. Listen, sin is unbelievably serious in the kingdom of God. It's a kingdom of purity. It's where righteousness is supposed to dwell. We have no chance, not one, starting with me, okay? We have no chance, not one of us in this room, of being righteous except by the blood of Jesus and the Holy Spirit's power in active in our life each and every day. Mm -hmm. We're all a wretch, every one of us in here and me. With, in dealing with non-believers, what is a better term than fear of God? Because when you hear fear of God, nobody's going to go, oh, I want that. Mm -hmm. you know, so how do you, like, how do you... I, I personally, I do not believe in softening that. No, yeah. but I mean, like, what's the word fear? Fear. Respect. Do you know fear. understand it? Means respect, but I think even respect is subjective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, because your respect and my respect are different. I think that people do need to shudder. You know, the Quakers, you guys have heard of the Quakers? Mm -hmm. You know how they got that name? Because they used to literally shake when they got together in the presence of the Lord. And I think there should be a shaking. Okay. The people that came through the Red Sea, the Israelites came to the Red Sea and they got to the foot of the mountain. And, and Moses said, listen, make sure everybody's pure. You know, I want everything right. I'm going to come down and I'm going to speak to the people. Mm -hmm. He did. And you know what the people did? Oh, it was so scary to hear the voice of God. It was like thunder, but the most scary thunder you've ever heard. And they said, we can't take it. We can't take it. Moses, you go on up the mountain. You find out what God wants to say. Come back down and tell us we can't handle hearing the voice of God. And Moses, he said he was scared and trembling. We should tremble. I'm not, I just, for me, I can't give you a softer answer. Yeah. No, I, I mean, it's just, it's kind of like the fear of God. You, you want to let them know that. The fear is to not to offend them, like you would be afraid of your parents if you got in trouble That's as right. a teenager. But what I'm saying is, why can't they be brought to a place like Martin Luther? I taught last night. Martin Luther was in law school, and he was walking with a friend down the street, and a major thunderstorm came. Lightning struck his friend right next to him. He was killed instantly, and Martin Luther flipped out. He was totally scared. He quit law school. It, it became a problem between him and his father the rest of his life. It created a bad relationship with him and his father the rest of his life. And he became an Augustinian monk because he became so scared of dying. He, had a, he experienced God in a fearful way. It was the best thing that ever happened to him. And this is what we need people to experience today. I don't believe... I, be, I will say this, I believe that so often the love of God message is, again, it's a wonderful message for those who are believers. Right. We can come together as believers right. and we can talk about the mm -hmm. love of God. It's a pearl. It's mm -hmm. precious. Mm -hmm. And we understand the cost of what it was to Jesus and the wretch that we were. We're not going to trample on that precious pearl. But Jesus himself said, don't throw pearls before swine. And swine was pig, and that was the unclean animal. Who is unclean? The people who are not believers. Don't throw pearls before swine. Do not talk to them about the love of God. Listen, I've heard too many testimonies where I've heard that people have said to me about coming to Jesus. They said, you know, I, I felt the Lord tugging at me. I felt him always kind of there. He was pulling on me. I saw his hand. I felt like I was to call. But I just kept putting him off. I just kept putting him off until all of a sudden one day, boom, something terrible happened to me. And I was scared to death that I cried out to the Lord. That was fear. 
It's the beginning of wisdom. See, now that's good to, because when someone says the fear of God, what is that? Then that's a an amazing and, and, way to explain right. it. Right, and see, what we don't like anymore, think about it. We've, we've, psychology and everything has changed. Don't let your child fear any fear. Don't let them hear you raise your voice. Don't do this. Don't do this. It's a counter. And what we have now are a whole bunch of counterfeit yes. conversions yeah. inside the kingdom of God. Yeah. Because people have said, oh, cool, God loves me just like I am. Great. I don't even have to change. This is awesome. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. You're right. And I think what you're saying is a fear. And just like we put the fear in the children to respect yeah. And that fear of yes. something happening to them bad, right. that fear that you put in them, if they were to run out to the street, you get them and you mm -hmm. spank them and you, you say, say hey, don't you ever do that. And yeah. I think that's the kind of fear we need to take. Exactly. That's the fear. And that isn't that the agree. greatest love you can do for a child? Right. Or right. a child who's getting ready to put their hand into the fireplace? Yeah. Right. What would you do? You'd smack that hand away fast because you love them, right? That's why I'm saying in a household, you might have children in your household who say, no, thank you. I want nothing whatsoever to do with the Lord. Fine, that's your decision. Because there is no such thing as the grandchildren of God, only the sons and daughters of God. <laughs> but guess what? In this house, we serve the Lord. Which means in this house, you will respect. Mm -hmm. You will follow this. They need to feel it. It's the mm -hmm. beginning of wisdom. And so true conversions come through a fear of the Lord. Then they can realize the cost and the love that God had for us. And then we can talk about the love of God. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I've been practicing this more and more because with my clients and stuff, when people like call themselves a believer, it's such a broad term. Right. So then I'll be like, you know, I'm like, okay, so you call yourself a, this is just the stance I take when they, when I know they're a believer mm -hmm. is I'll be like, oh, okay, you're a believer. So I'll talk to them as a believer and it's like, oh, you're divorced now, and you're sleeping around, but, you know, like, yeah. girl, how's God feeling about that? Right. Yeah. Love, right. like, harsh stuff, right? And they're, yes. now, I, I'm thinking about, like, evangelists as you're talking and as you're asking this question, because I don't know, I'm not, I don't know if I'm an evangelist or not, but, like, how do, how do they go do street ministry and share the gospel with fear and draw people in without pushing them away, mm -hmm. um, but also be bold and loving, right. you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm with you. I want to know more about that too, mm -hmm. because there's so many different groups of people okay, we're talking loving, to. Loving, the greatest love you can do is to speak truth. She because has loved and <clears throat> cared about the woman at the well, and he said to her, get me a drink and go get your husband. He went right to the issue. Right. right. And they're not rejecting. And he was the least, he, he, Jesus, don't ever get the idea that Jesus ever was politically correct. He had no tact. Yeah. If you reread yeah. the yeah. Gospels and what yeah. Jesus did, what he said in situations, there was no politically correct and there was no tact. That's why as long as he kept his mouth shut and did things, exercised demons, healed people, multiplied food. Hey, they had no grocery bills. They had no medical bills. You're our man, Jesus. We yeah. want you. They loved him as long as he just kept his mouth shut and did things. And the, the world loves Christian philanthropy, but that is not the gospel. And that's what the world wants, yeah. to shut your mouth and do your good stuff. Uh-uh. Yeah. And that's why I don't agree with so many churches that do philanthropy, but they never give a message of challenge with it. Yeah. Jesus never did all of that without giving a message of challenge. Yeah. And it was always challenging. What put him on the cross? Why did the Jews reject him? Not based on what he did, based on what he said. Yeah. So get the idea about being loving. We're loving to each other. The great, that, that's that, that new kind of... Uh, Definition of love that we're right, talking love about love. right now. Right. True love, you really love them? Yeah. Tell, me Tell me You know what? You better, because you don't know if the Lord isn't going to let the last breath be tomorrow. What right. if we get hit by a truck yeah. tomorrow? Yeah. We don't have much time left, guys. Yeah. We really don't. We got to get to work and we got to get the whole idea politically correct out. We need to stir the fear of God. If you have children or grandchildren mm -hmm. that are not serving the Lord, mm -hmm. stop tiptoeing around them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Start speaking the word of God. Start being bold 
And know that the Holy Spirit will come along and confirm your word. It's yeah. his job. Yeah. You've said it, boom, over. Yeah. Now let the Holy Spirit do it. That's how Jesus worked. And in that sense, Nanette, we need to have the fear of the Lord, too, yeah. to be bold yes. that way. Yes. And and in I, that I boldness, sometimes I'll say something, and it's it feels harsh <coughs> coming out, but it's that it's like, oh, did I go a little too yeah. far? No. But in that is when I feel like when Tracy Spinner's telling mm -hmm. stories about how she interacts with her clients, I feel like it's in that, oh, that was a little harsh, but they're like... Thank you. Yes, I amen. needed that. That's but amen. um, and people they're not. Are, do you realize how starving people are for truth? They are, yeah. and people they're not are rejecting us. Yeah, they're rejecting Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I feel like just as much as when I, on Judgment Day, I have to answer for that. Well, you had this opportunity to speak life into this person, and you didn't. They have to answer for it too. Ginger spoke life into you, and you rejected it. You rejected me. Yeah, and I think also honestly and. This is my personal opinion, but I believe that right now in the United States of America, for sure, there is many people right now who are want nothing to do with the Lord. We as a country have shoved the Lord out of this, this country. I know that. That's true. But I do feel like just within our communities, each where all true believers are meeting, I believe that there are so many, especially young people. My heart is so for young people who are so lost. Look what's happening to the young people. They don't have an identity. They're trying to change their sex. They don't know who they are. And all of this stems from they need answers. They haven't gotten answers. They don't know what to think. They're searching. They want answers. And we're just tiptoeing around worried about offending them when they're headed for eternal lake. Of fire? No, thank you. Guys, let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it right. And I think the biggest thing that I'm noticing in talking with people is that the non believers and even the new believers feel like God is their servant. Right. right. The other way around. Right. Santa. Right. And this and it's That's like, right. you know, he's gonna serve me. It's yeah. like what he's gonna take care of all my wants, all my needs. Yeah. And they've completely lost that next step. Right. Again, right. the churches aren't saying no. anything, but when God you read, is such a good God. Right. When you read the New Testament, whether it's the Gospels or Acts or the rest of the epistles, think about the boldness of what the people are saying in there. Think about that, how bold they're being. That's our call, yeah. to be bold. Exactly. So let me, let me finish up. The respect. That's the first thing, that the principle of God. The Ten Commandments are respect, okay? Um... The, most of the Ten Commandments are about actions or words, but the last one, thou shalt not covet, that's about your feelings. It's the only one that has to do with your heart, and only the Holy Spirit can deal with our nasty, wicked hearts, okay? All right, the next principle, responsibility, okay? Society increasingly tells us that we're really not responsible, <laughs> excuse me, for our actions. You're a victim. I'm a victim, you're a victim, right? For whatever reason. You've got daddy issues. It's okay. It was your daddy's fault. Right? <laughs> oh, brother. Okay. Exodus clearly states through the law that we are responsible before God for how we live and with regard to his law. There is no victim mentality in the um, Bible whatsoever. Then let's talk about retribution, okay? Retribution, yeah, God is a God of retribution. There are reasons for punishment. First and foremost, for reformation. It's intended to make the wrongdoer better. As Susan said, a little child goes out into the street. You're going to swat its behind. You're going to scare him to death so that what? He's reformed to never again run past the curb, right? That's what you're hoping for in dealing with that child. The harsher you do it the first time, the quicker the reform is going to take place. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right. Um, secondly, though, retribution is for deterrence. It's intended as a warning to other would-be malefactors. In other words, look what happened to them. Remember we talked about capital punishment. The world will tell you you are the most unloving people if you believe in capital punishment. But actually... It's a reduction of the sanctity of life. When a society stops capital punishment, they no longer value life. It's a reduction in the value of life. It's been proven. Look at the Arab nations. You steal and they cut your hand off. They don't have a problem with that there. Yeah. 
<laughs> so, so, yeah, you, just look at it. Just take a look at it. Really, seriously, take a look at that. You want to be God? You want to have that? Have that? Mm -hmm. And you are living in a government that, boom, if you are caught stealing, your hand goes, you wouldn't steal. Mm -hmm. So it is determined. Sorry. Would the death penalty fall under mm -hmm. capital punishment? Right. So it's almost like not you're doing them a favor, but they're living such a... You better not You're shortening their life. You're almost You're like taking the life of something that God has created. You have no right to touch that which God has created. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So it's a warning in terms. But third, simply retribution. It's simply because the wrongdoer deserves punishment. In other words, they earned it. They earned the punishment that they got. They clearly earned it. Now, I want to end this lesson today with an incredibly important passage in the New Testament, because Logan brought something up a little while ago about living under the law of Moses versus living under the law of, of Christ. Because we have a real big situation here in which we've got people under the impression, for the most part, that you had the law of Moses over here, you have Christ who did his work, who died, who shed his blood for your sin, and then people live under the law of Christ over here, which is life, right? And over here you had a retributive God, and over here you have a forgiving God. That's kind of the idea of it. Well, grace, it's grace. Grace covers me. I live under grace. Thank you, Jesus. I live under grace, right? Okay, I want you to understand that over here, if, if they committed a sin, a particular sin, right, then what would they do in order to make themselves right before God? Well, well how, how? They would sacrifice a God. Right. In other words, before they went to go worship the Lord and they knew that they had sin in their life, they first stopped by their barn and they would pick up a lamb or whatever it was and they would bring that lamb to the temple, to the priest, and the priest would sacrifice that innocent life for a guilty life. There was an exchange that happened, right? But now, Jesus made the exchange for us, so we no longer need to go to our barn first and get an animal in order to become right with God, because we now have the blood of Jesus, right? But let me show you something. Go to Hebrews chapter 10 that most people don't understand. Hebrews chapter 10. Um, do you have, does somebody else have the New Living Translation, or excuse me, the NIV? I do. do you? Yeah. Can you, I'm going to read it first out of the NLT, and then Logan, I want you to read it out of the NIV, okay? The NLT is too soft, okay? And, and it is a little bit more of a paraphrase type of book, but it says this. Dear friends, wait, what verse? 26, sorry. 26. Chapter 10, verse Verse uh, 10. Now he's speaking to believers. He is not speaking to unbelievers. Only believers now. So this is to us. Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. There is only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume his what? Mm -hmm. Enemies, which puts you in a category of an enemy. For anyone, now listen, listen to verse 28. For anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses <coughs> was put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Just think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God and have treated the blood of the covenant which made us holy as if it were common and unholy and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit who brings God's mercy to us. For we know the one who said, I will take revenge, I will pay them back. He also said, the Lord will judge his own people. Okay, 
Can you read that same passage for me, Logan, please? 26 through and then 31. Yeah. It was pretty similar, but um, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we receive knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left, but only a fearful, fearful expectation of judgment of raging fire that will consume the en enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses uh, died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more uh, severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as unholy thing of the blood, uh, the unholy the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For, for we know him who said, quote, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Thank you. This is huge, and this is what is not being taught at yeah. all in the churches anymore. We talked really quick, and I'm not going to go on to lesson 11 this week. It's kind of perfect. We'll just end it a couple minutes early, but this is one last concept that you must know. Okay. You've got the law of Moses that operated for the kingdom of God, the nation of Israel, before Jesus came. Jesus, or excuse me, God set up a sacrificial system, correct? Yeah. Called Torah-based Judaism. That before you go to worship the one true God, you stop by your barn, you pick up a lamb, and you sacrifice the lamb. That blood that the lamb shed was for this, unintentional sins. It was for unintentional sins. It wasn't for intentional sins. In other words, you got two people flirting with each other, and both of them are married. And they start crossing the line, and they can't stop, and they fall into adultery. In the back of their mind, they weren't thinking, oh, okay, geez, we've got to make sure we get to um, Shabbat on Friday night and get the lamb on Saturday so that we can have forgiveness of this act that we have just committed. They weren't thinking that. If that did happen, something like that, their only hope was to not get caught by man, but God saw. Mm -hmm. If they got caught by man, there was no sacrifice that could cover those sins because it was an intentional sin. It wasn't an unintentional sin. So what did they do with the two? They brought them out back and what? Stoned, Stoned them. The sacrificial system that was set up here was for unintentional sin. They were given the law and they were expected to live by it. Thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. They had to live. And there was still, so really what it was is the, 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 the blood that was shed is for all of the intentions of the heart and all of that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Now we read in Hebrews that on the other side, under the law of Christ that gives life, that we live by grace, that Jesus gave his life up and shed his blood for intentional sin? Did he give it up for intentional sin? No. The law of Christ exceeds and goes beyond the law of Moses. So just as there was no sacrifice for intentional sin on this side, you can't come along and tell me that Jesus, who is so much more worth than any sheep, animal that now you can live intentionally in sin and claim the blood of Jesus. All you can expect is the fiery judgment of God. Mm -hmm. Do you see the seriousness of sin? Mm -hmm. Would you repeat that again? <laughs> <laughs> What's more valuable, an animal or Jesus? Jesus. Jesus. Okay. The animal only covered unintentional sin. It never covered intentional and sin. What? What's Intentional, like uh, murdering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I'm, I'm gonna, I'm mm -hmm. gonna go and do this. I'm gonna commit adultery. I'm gonna do, do this, right? So what would, I mean, if if we're taught that sin is sin, like that God doesn't see sin different. I mean, yeah, sin you know, is sin, and it's right, wrong. Right, it's right. wrong. There's so a right what, wrong. but what is what would be considered unintentional sin? Right. Well, exactly. And now, do you see the seriousness of sin? Yes. Do you see how serious sin is? Everything. Because we know that the law of Christ says, 
Um, even if you look on someone with lust, it's sin. <coughs> oh man, I'm a mess. So that means I really need the power of the Holy Spirit. Now I'm really wanting to get serious about being holy. Do yeah. you understand the difference? Yes. What I was trying to say is, if a lamb's blood, an animal's blood, wasn't um, used to cover intentional sin, how much more valuable is Christ's blood? But it's being treated as if it covers intentional sin on this right. side with this word of grace. It's a misunderstanding of grace. And yet, that's exactly how the church is living. They're living and not repenting, and they're living in sin still, and say, oh, well, yeah, I could just ask forgiveness for it. You know how many young people I have talked to about their lifestyle? Yes. That believe in Jesus and are really pretty good kids for the most part and they say well yeah, I know I really don't try to do that too much I try not to sleep around too much I really really try not to but I know I can just ask Jesus to forgive me no you can't that's not what the blood is for so how would you explain it to someone else and say the blood of Jesus was still for intent unintentional sin that's right I would read in this passage right here yeah let's read it again now with that understanding it's only for unintentional. Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, do you have the truth? Now Listen, we all guys, know. <laughs> there is not one of us is ever going to be able to stand and say, I didn't know. It's all right here. It's been made available to us. And what this writer of the Hebrews is saying is, you're treating the blood of Jesus as common or unholy you're not even giving it the same reverence that even the stupid lambs were given. There is no sacrifice in Torah-based Judaism or in the life of Christ and his sacrifice on the cross for intentional sin. It is serious, serious, serious business. That's why we want to get up every day and say, thank you, Lord, your mercies are new every day. Lord, I need your mercy. Lord, I got a problem in this area in my life. It's sin. I recognize it. And Lord, I don't want to do it today. But there's just this bent in me that just pulls me in this direction. I'm not pulled in that direction, like that person is on that, but I'm pulled in this direction. Mm -hmm. This is my problem, Lord. Holy Spirit, I want you to work with me today. I, I want to partner with you today. Would you help me today overcome this? Do you now start seeing how we're working on a relationship about our sin? Yeah. Right. And so let's say you fall and you know it was wrong. Oh, yes, you do have an advocate and you can come. But let's face it. Our life should look different six months after we've come to Christ or three months after or even a week after versus 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And the Lord is just going to keep shining something on me. Now he says, okay, now we're not here. I worked here before. Now, you see this thing in your life right here? Let's, let's get bit. Yeah, I see. I didn't see that before. And, and 10 years from now, now there's something else you probably have had a blind spot to, but this. Let's, let's start working. Do you see how he does that with each of us? Yeah. And we've got, because he wants us to be like who? Like yeah, Christ. Yeah. Right, Christ. We're, he took our hell in order that we might go to the throne every day and put on Christ. He gave us that. We get to put on Christ every single day. Isn't that incredible? Now I need your Holy Spirit. When I'm in my prayer closet at home alone, when I'm on my knees praying, or when I'm alone with the Lord, I have no problem being holy. It's awesome. I got my Bible out. I'm praying. I'm sitting. Nothing can happen. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I just love. It's great. But when I get up and I have to all of a sudden start going out into the world and I got to work, I got to deal with other people, or you know, my husband comes home, or one of my kids, or da 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 da, -da whatever. Now I'm in a little bit of a tension. You see that? Mm -hmm. And so things can come out in me. Maybe God allowed them to have something in them that touches and flares off something in me that the Lord wants to work in my life. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to tell you is sin is an incredibly, incredibly important issue. And we're not talking about that enough. That's mm -hmm. why I love what um, City Church is doing right now, James. Mm -hmm. It's saying, listen, there's a power. And we're called to live in our deeds to be like Jesus. We can't do it on our own. We'll, we'll fail. Don't even try. Don't even try. You can't do it. But the Holy Spirit partnering with you can through you. Yes. So, like, intentional sin. So, you're going to get, huh. so if you just, like, you're talking about dealing with your relationship with the Lord mm -hmm. and, and poking in those things and working on it. But if people, if we're just out there intentionally 
right. sinning and right. saying, oh, I've got right. grace. Uh-huh. I mean, he, he's going to deal like with the us. Young he's going to punish I was still, us. That's why I told that young person, because I loved him. He truly was in the dark. I mean, he loves the Lord. He seriously loves the Lord. And he really believed he was fine. And he goes, yeah, I really try not to sleep around too much. I, I know. I know I really shouldn't do it, but I really try to limit it. But, you know, I know I can ask for forgiveness. But he was living with an understanding on this side of the cross that I can intentionally sin and go back and ask for for No. Mm -hmm. You can't live that way. Will we fall into sin at times? Sure. We're we're a work in progress. But our intention needs to be what? I want to be holy today. Right, because he's... He, he didn't hurt. know. Well, and he could he could end up dealing with uh, per, with consequences to that. He will. He, well, he, well, I mean, he God's right going to say, yeah. what are you doing? And he goes, really? He didn't know. Right. He was like, wait, really? Yes. Really. And that's a result, by the way, may I add, of a kid being raised in the church. Mm-hmm. It's very amazing. And this is TMI, because you guys know my kids who just ignore this statement. But <laughs> um, <laughs> not leave this room. <laughs> but I have four daughters. My twins are 21. One's engaged, getting married in September. One's about ready to get engaged. You're going to get married before next summer. It's amazing to me the responses that I get from people. Are they just getting married so fast and qu- so quickly so that they don't they commit sin and have sex? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they're blo- that, is that the only reason? Yeah. And like they don't understand like the magnitude. Like, okay, this is yeah. huge. This is awesome also, that they're... That, that they're they understand that the right, you know. The right well, here's the thing. Right. God gave us appetites. Right. He gave us many appetites. He gave us appetites for food. Mm-hmm. He gave us appetites for exercise and being outside, mm-hmm. for pleasurable things, for, for sex. Sex is not dirty. Sex is not wrong. He gave appetites to us all. Mm-hmm. Those are good things. It was Greek thinking that got into the church that said any appetite that your physical body happens to have is bad, so you need to not be married, you're holier, and you need to not eat, and, you're and all that kind of stuff. They took a vow of silence, and a vow of fasting, and a vow of celibacy, all of this kind of stuff. That wasn't how God intended you to live. God, we're made in his image. And these appetites that we have are wonderful appetites. But what God has said is, now, I, I made you, I'm responsible, I know how you function best. I know the best way for you to function. And there's a limit on your appetites. And your body's going to function better if you don't overeat. And your body's going to function better if you get sleep and don't stay up all night, pardon me. And your body's going to function properly if you go ahead and do have sex, but it's got to be inside a committed, loyal relationship where you don't end up divorcing. It's, it's forever. And I believe that this society has gotten way off because kids don't get married early anymore. The devil came along and said, no, you're not mature enough. You need to wait, right. no. And it's created way more problems. You do need to get married young. That's when you have the energy to have kids. And it keeps it would keep a lot of these young people out of trouble. There's been so much trouble in the 20s. With this. It is. It's right. And so I am a proponent of marriage early. My, my youngest son got married at... Um, 21 years old and um i have an older son who's not married yet but and and i feel bad because he wants to be married so bad and the lord's got a plan for him he does but the fact of the matter is he wants marriage he's got to got to have the right girl but he wants it but everybody i i tell the young people you need to get married get married put your head down start you know for because god deals with us especially in marriage a lot of things happen there and as a parent. So I don't care if people yeah. say, well, they just, they just want to have sex. Fine, yeah, I agree. They do want to have sex. <laughs> you know what? Sex is fun. It's, it's good. good. It's nice. It's right. not wrong. But there's a way to do it. And our creator said, this is when right. to have sex. Well, that's right. Just right here. And, and just because people keep talking to me about it. Yeah. Like, Ignore it. They don't want to say yes. But then now I'm understanding it. Going, yes. Yeah, and why do you have such a problem with that? Like, they're going to have sex and yes. they're going to get married. And they're, getting, and they're like, doing like, it in the righteous and, way. Right. Exactly. Yes, like, exactly. God created yeah. it. All the appetites. We are to enjoy food, but in a balance. Right. This is, um, I wanted to ask this before I left today, but uh, this is on the topic before this topic. Um, when So if I have if I have an unintentional sin that I, I need to address and like change, 
how do you know what uh, do I pray to, for the Holy Spirit to come in and change my heart? Do I pray to God? Like well, what? I, that is you one. Who's three pray first, to? That's so a really silly. good question. Okay. And and God is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, He is one. Yeah. But um, He is also three persons, one God. Correct. Okay. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And you get caught up in the Trinity, and you can pray to all three, but he knows your heart. Mm -hmm. But you can pray, and you can understand that each of them has a plan. God has a plan. Jesus carried out his job, if you will, his mission, so that we could carry out our destiny now. Mm -hmm. And he's given us the power of the Holy Spirit to do it. We can sit back and we can say, well, Lord, how in the world could I possibly accomplish this? And he'll help us to remember how Jesus did some things. Oh, I have an older brother. I have Jesus who I can look to. He demonstrated how to live. But I can't do that. The only way Jesus did it was that he was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, Holy Spirit, would you help me today? I know you've pointed this thing out in my life. It is sin. And I, I don't hate it. And I want to hate it. But I like it right now. So will you start by changing my desire? Like, the girl changed Michael's desire to, to got in, her, got in his heart, man, he's in the shower. <laughs> because sin is only brought on by our, our own desires. Nasty desires, desires. That and that's where it's going to start. Right. If you're just going to try to say, okay, this is really bad, i just got to go out. Now it's a one-way street. You're going to have to start by asking the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I know I'm a mess, I know this, I've got, this is going to take a while, I get it. But I really, you know my intention, I want to get it right. But it's going to have to start with me hating this thing. And you know what? He'll start changing your desire. It's amazing what he does. That's why I'm saying, this is why I'm preaching such a serious message. To whom much is given, the Bible says, much is required. So those who are on this side of the cross, every one of us in this room, are going to have to answer to God for a lot more than those on that side of the cross. Do you see the, see the seriousness of this? All right? Okay, so, any other questions? I have one last question. Okay, okay so, like, say, uh, like, I get offended easily. Um, now, it, 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 it starts out unintentionally, but now I'm like, ugh, I got offended again. So does that, like, does unintentional sin, sin ever become intentional? Yeah, I guess it could be, but here's another thing you just brought. <clears throat> Maybe this helped answer it. You can trust the Holy Spirit to deal with things in your life. Listen, we know the basics. We know what's sin. You don't need to ask the questions. A shooting up drops and, and you know, da, 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 da. we know what sin is. But now we start getting into the real personal things that we're hanging on to. Those. Trust the Holy Spirit to bring a conviction to start talking to you. And you'll start feeling this like when you think about it. You'll just be like, oh, you know, like, are you bugging me about that? You'll know because it just starts with this conviction following. And talk to him about it. You know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, before Jesus went to the cross, he prayed to the Father, no, please, please, no, please, no. And that's how we feel about our sin. No, please don't take this away from me because I like it. <laughs> <laughs> and he was saying, oh, please, no, Lord, but not my will, but thy will be done. And there's a surrendering that says, okay, Lord, by faith, because the kingdom of God operates by faith, I will pray this. Not my will, but thy will, but Lord, I don't even like that. I got a real problem. I just don't even like it. I like this part of me. I know it's wrong, but I do like it. So will you start working on me and be willing to let him work on you? He'll work on you with offense or whatever it is. Don't worry about what, it, what it's categorized. Oh, my God. The Holy Spirit's just going to start working on you. He's going to talk to each of you in a different way, and he's going to bring things to your mind. And you can just say, the moment you fall, just say, oh, Lord, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. The devil will want to keep you away from going to the throne of God. You, you did it again? Mm -hmm. Really? Don't you, you can't approach God. Mm -hmm. You have totally disappointed him. Don't you dare. Ah, that's a lie from the pit yeah. of hell. You run. You run to the mercy seat and just say, Lord, I'm so sorry. And you'll start realizing that, you know what? What you used to do 30 times a day starts to be 29 times a day. Then 28 times a day, then 15 times, and it starts because you're in partnership with the Holy Spirit. You're, he's reworking you. He's patient. He's going to do it. But be working with Him. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your precious Holy Spirit that you have sent to indwell in each of us. Each of us, we know we're all nasty. But you just, you already see us as completed as Christ. You already see us perfected. Wow. 
thank you for that vision of us, that you have a vision. Lord, it's much like a coach who's sculpting an athlete and getting that athlete ready. And that they have a picture in their mind of, of the body of that athlete. And they're working patiently to get that athlete to look like that. Lord, that's what you're doing with us, and we thank you. Thank you that you have given us your word in the seriousness of sin. Holy Spirit, we each have sin in our life, and we each come before you, and we say, deal with us in that area. Would you start by changing our desires, Lord? That's just where it starts, and we want to work with you. Thank you for this word. Lord, I pray it would be embedded that the enemy and no one else could take it away. May it be, become part of our new DNA, part of the newness to life. Lord, we thank you for it. Bless each of us as we go our way, Lord, and may we affect this world with truth, unabridged, Lord, in a, uh, a truthful, loving way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, next week on to Lesson 11, okay?